Amen. Brothers and sisters, friends and guests, it is so good to see you this morning. If this is your first time to the seed or you're still new to the church learning about it, we warmly welcome you here. We are so glad that you are with us. And there are little cards that look just like this, little purple cards, all around the windowsills in this room. Website on one side and a QR code on another. So if you want to learn about the church, get connected, uh, if you have a question to ask or you want to get our church app just to stay in the loop, go ahead and grab one of these today before you leave. So there is, a, on, on Amazon Prime right now, you can get a animated version of The Pilgrim's Progress. It's one of those famous Christian books written by John Bunyan when he was in prison. He's a Puritan pastor. And it's a really great show. My boys love it. We've watched it, I think, two or three times together. But there's this scene where the main character becomes a Christian. If you're familiar with The Pilgrim's Progress, it's basically a story of, of walking in faith. He becomes a Christian, and he makes his first bad decision and, and comes off the path in this story. And um, though God has told him in this letter, this is the path you need to walk, he takes a different path, and he goes to this place called Legality. And legality is this huge judge who says, well, of course you can come to know God. Just start climbing the mountain. Put on the backpack and climb the mountain. And, and he's trying to climb the mountain, and he cannot make it, and he's failing, and he's failing, and he falls. And then the evangelist comes and finds him and says, why'd you leave the path? And so he starts making excuses like, well, this guy said this, and this guy said that. And the evangelist says, you didn't listen, did you? And so he starts weeping, and he repents. And, and there's this moment where he has to make a decision. Am I going to get back on the path, or am I so beaten up by my failure and stuck in my pride that I don't know how to get going again, right? And so in the story, he gets back on the path and starts going. And the reason why I tell you that is, number one, if you have Amazon Prime, you should watch that. It's a really great show, especially if you have kids. There's a, an amazing, we, we'd be watching it and hit pause and just talking about, you know, things of, of the word and of scripture with my boys, but... I wanted to connect it with Lent season. We're in Lent season right now, moving toward Easter Sunday. And the purpose of Lent season is to anticipate and celebrate and treasure Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday is all about that Jesus is alive. Because he is alive, your sin is dead. Because he is alive, you're new, you're different. Sin and death can no longer hold you. That is the hope of Christianity. But... So often, we have keys to the Lamborghini, and it's in the driveway, and we don't ever drive it. Because one time we wrecked it, and we're too afraid to get back in. Right? And so Lent season is a time of Christian discipline. We're practicing disciplines together, because it's through this ability to go back to the beginning and just do the basics and do the rudiments again that gets us back in the car and going again. Are you following? And if we don't do that well as believers, if we're not able, as Paul says, to identify with the crucifixion so that we may identify with the resurrection, then we don't grow in Christ. So that's why right now we're practicing these Christian disciplines and just going back to the basics, right? And so I was even thinking this morning, as some humble pie. I told you last week, we're going to get through Philippians all together as a church three times. I'm sure some of you did not make that and intended to, right? And I didn't read my two chapters yesterday. I only read Philippians two and a half times. And up here, I was like, it'll be fine. You'll get through it. You'll read it. It'll be no problem. And here I am, didn't follow through on that discipline. So we've practiced humility, fasting, and study. This next week, we're practicing prayer. And so what I want to say to you is, maybe you're going, you know, Ryan, I sort of had intentions on the front end of this, of doing these disciplines, but I've kind of blown it. I would say, all right, pick up the keys, get back in the car. Right? Let's pray this week. We can do it. Let's get back in the car. Let's lean in. Let's practice discipline so we can move toward walking more in the resurrection of Jesus. So today's message is going to be all about prayer, preparing us for prayer starting tomorrow through the following Saturday. And this whole sermon is going to be driven by questions. 
And the three headings that we'll break it up into are pretty simple. Number one, the prayer that guides all prayer. Number two, why is prayer so important if God is sovereign? And number three, does God answer all prayer? We're going to ask those questions together. So first, the prayer that guides all prayer. I'm going to read the Lord's Prayer again. Derek just kindly read it for us a moment ago as our focus scripture. Let me read it again so it's in our hearts and minds. And we're going to talk about the Lord's Prayer together. We are in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And here's what it says. Therefore... You should pray like this, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This prayer is brilliant. It really is the prayer that guides all prayer. And I want to show you how. How this prayer guides all prayer. Nowhere in the Bible, other than here, does Jesus ever say, pray like this. And then say, here it is. Now, he, he does not mean you can only use these words. Otherwise, we'd all be speaking in Aramaic, right? Because that's how he originally spoke it. But there is a heart and a format and a clarity to this prayer that drives all prayer. And so the first thing I want to show you is the five pieces of the Lord's Prayer. It's up on the screen here, so you can follow along as as I list it here. The Lord's Prayer leads us to pray about these five major things. Number one, God's glory. Number two, God's will. Number three, our daily needs. Number four, our sins and the sins of others. And number five, deliverance from temptation and evil. Those five elements were all in the Lord's Prayer very clearly. And so we'll start taking those apart piece by piece. But one quick note that might help you right now. Maybe some of you have got to an impasse in your life before where you opened the Bible because you were looking for an answer about something. There was something you wanted an answer for. Maybe something general, maybe something specific. And perhaps you walked away feeling a bit let down, that I don't think the Bible has a good answer for this. And here's what we're going to see from the Lord's Prayer today. The Bible does not just give you answers. It teaches you to ask the right questions. That's really important you understand that. The Bible is not exhaustive. What that means is it doesn't exhaustively tell you everything you could ever want to know or think you should know about God or yourself or the world, but the Bible is sufficient to tell you what God knows you need. And so think about how babies develop. They watch mom and dad move their mouths, and they learn how to speak based on mom and dad speaking. And what that means is that this is God's word. God the Father is the one who speaks first, which means everything that we communicate is always a response in that sense. So the word of God doesn't just say, hey, you come up with your own questions and I'll give you answers. The Bible says, no, you have to submit yourself to even find out, are you even asking the right questions? Are we even asking the right questions, right? So let's jump into this together. And we're going to ask five questions of this prayer that guides all prayer. Question number one, why do we pray about God's glory first, that he would be honored as holy? Isn't that interesting? Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Older versions said it this way, hallowed be your name. To hallow something means to honor it, to treasure it, to adore it. And by the way, this word glory maybe sounds kind of Bible-y to you. What in the world's glory? You know, when I think of glory, you only hear that on ESPN, the glory of the patriots who've won the Super Bowl again, right? What's glory mean? Glory means weight. Glory means substance. The glory of something is its value, its significance, its beauty. That's what something's glory is. So the first thing Jesus leads us to pray about is God's glory, that he'd be honored. 
And if you think about it for a moment, it makes all the sense in the world. And here's why. More than anything else, if Jesus is right, more than anything else, you and everyone you know needs to be in right relationship with God more than anything. More than anything. More than anything else, you and I will cut ourselves off from life if we don't see God rightly. If the way I see God and the way I see something else makes me say, "Mm, God, but this... So the first thing we pray about is what? God, your name be honored as holy. In my life, in the life of everyone around me, God, today around the world, make yourself beautiful, glorious, wonderful, majestic. Draw people to you. Open eyes, open ears, soften hearts. Your name be honored as holy above all. We pray about that first because more than anything else, that's what we need. That's always what we need, isn't it? C.S. Lewis has this great metaphor where he talks about, yeah, when I became a Christian, I chose Jesus. But he said what really happened was when I saw Jesus for who he was, I realized I was eating mud pies. When I finally saw Jesus for who he was, I realized that this is what I've been giving my life to. I don't want, I don't want this anymore. So what's the difference there? That he's, you see God for who he really is. So the first thing we pray about in the Lord's Prayer, God, be glorified, be honored, be seen, be adored. Second question, why do we pray that God's will be done before we make any requests of him? Listen to the order again of the prayer. He says right here in verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then verse 11, give us today our daily bread. So, Jesus instructs us to pray for God's will before you pray for your needs, right? And if you think about it, here's the brilliance of this prayer. You have no idea what you need, and neither do I. Now, you might say, yes, I do, Ryan. But there's a reality that you don't know what's going to happen tonight or tomorrow or next week. You have no idea what's coming up in your life. None. And so, so we could be praying about something a year from now, and we might die in six months. In a real sense, you have no idea what you need. And if we were wise, we would say, God, please always let your will come before mine. You can see. You can see what's coming and what's happening in the world and what I truly need. I don't know that. So we always pray first, God, your kingdom come Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, whatever you want, what you're doing, what you've decided, let that be. Let that be. But we're still instructed to pray for daily bread. And I think the reason is fairly simple. The Christian God is not an intellectual construct or an idea or a statue. We're in relationship with God. He wants to hear your heart. We, we pray, no matter how big something is or small something is, we ought to feel boldness to go before God and pray about absolutely anything. There, there should be no shame in praying about winning a soccer game all the way up to being healed of cancer. We got to bring all that to the Lord. We share that. We pour our heart out. We're in relationship with him, but we don't ever pray for those needs before we ground our prayer in your will. And Jesus does exactly this in the Garden of Gethsemane, does he not? Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. The brilliance of this prayer, that we're laying it in God's hands first. God, you know what I don't. You're the shepherd, I'm the sheep, right? You're the king, I'm the one who's following. Third question we can ask of this prayer. Why do we pray for daily bread and not annual bread? Man, I wish Jesus talked about praying for annual bread. You know, in the midst of concern, worry, or something else, God, can you show me 
that 365 days from now, everything is still going to be okay. Can you sort of give me that longer vision? Give me my annual bread? No, we pray for daily bread. So what's that tell us about prayer? It it shows us prayer is daily. It's regular. There's relational aspect to being with God in praying, having a regular prayer life. So later in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, pray without ceasing. Of course, he doesn't mean that you start a prayer and never end it. He just means on a regular basis, you're praying. Where's Paul getting that? From Jesus. Give us this day our daily bread. Question four. Why do we acknowledge our sin before we mention the sins of others? Do you notice how that prayer is structured? Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Why does Jesus lead us to talk about our sin first? And when you think about it, it's brilliant. When a person does not acknowledge the gravity or reality of their own sin, they're incapable of forgiving others. Because you have to receive forgiveness to know how to give it. You have to. And let me help some of you, because I know how the enemy works. I know how my own heart works. And there's got to be some people in this room going, there's things I can't let go of. In a bitterness, grudge, cold shoulder, distance. And here's what's going on in your heart and my heart when this happens. You're stuck in a feeling of superiority. You may say, wait a second, that's, that's pushing too hard on me, Ryan. No, it's not. When you can't forgive, you're feeling superior to someone else. And here's what's subconsciously happening. I would never say that. Why would they say that about me or this person? I wouldn't do that. I don't struggle with that. How could they think that, do that, be that way, act that way, feel that way? I would never dot, dot, dot. Now, how do you get rid of that? How do you do battle in your own heart? Well, you do what Jesus brilliantly shows us. Forgive us our debts, we say first. Because, friends... Was there ever a time in your life that you did something where someone could have said, I wouldn't say that? Why would you talk like that? Why would you do that? What were you thinking? Have you not had those moments? People could look at my life and moments of my life and say, Ryan, why would you say that about that person? Why would you do that? And it's only when I have the humility to let that sit. That I'm able to not look down on other people. And I can say, God, forgive my debts as I release the debts of others. And once again, prayer is daily. So this rears its head over and over. Forgiveness is not one and done. If you've never understood forgiveness, you need to think of it like an economic debt because it is that way. Listen, if you come to my house and you break something I care a lot about, what do I care a lot about at my house? I like my French press. I like my French press. I like coffee. Okay? So you come to my house, we're watching football, the team loses, and you just throw my French press on the ground and break it, right? Now, if I were to say, I forgive you, Does that mean magically the French press now come back together, reverse time, and now it's on my shelf? No, it's gone. If I say I forgive you, what am I saying? I'm going to go out and buy myself a new French press with my money. I'm absorbing the debt that you created in my life. And when you're forgiving someone, you always have two options. You make them pay the debt or you pay the debt. There's no other way. And so if someone wounds you, every time you see them and you feel that, you're deciding either you're going to pay this debt right now or I'm going to work on absorbing it and say, I forgive you. I forg-. And it rears its head again. 
And I say, I'll pay for that. I forgive you. And it shows up again until we're released from it. That's how forgiveness actually works. That's the brilliance of this prayer, that on a regular basis, Jesus is encouraging us to remember our sin that we've been forgiven of. Lord, forgive my debts as I release the debts of others. You following? The power of that prayer, the brilliance and beauty of it. Question number five, then, of the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that guides all prayer. Why do we pray that our sins would be forgiven before praying for strength in trials and temptations? The last thing in the Lord's Prayer is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now that seems like a really high priority. Why is that the last thing in the Lord's Prayer? And if you think about it, here's the brilliance of it. Suffering and hardship in and of itself cannot make you worse. In and of itself, suffering will not destroy you. A sinful response to your suffering will blow you up. What's a great example? The book of Job. What happens in the book of Job? Job is a godly man. And Satan approaches God. And, and, and Satan says, God, do you think Job serves you for nothing? Do you think Job actually loves you? <laughs> That's a joke, God. Job does not love you. Job prays to you and goes to church and does these things because you've blessed him. He has many kids. He has a lot of money. He has a banging house. Don't you see, God? Job loves you for what you give him. If you took that away, he would curse you into the ground. And God says, done. You can take anything but Job's life. I trust that Job loves me. And in the book of Job, the enemy is allowed to take everything from Job except his life. And Job does not turn from God. But his friends are pretty poor friends, aren't they? They're like, Job, bro, bro, don't you know the yin and yang? Don't you know the, the way the world works? You know karma, what goes around comes around. Job, the wheels are falling off your life because you've messed up. You've sinned, and that's why your life is a wreck. And then his wife is like, curse God and die. This is awful. And Job just stays and stays. Even though he never accuses God directly, he complains. And at the end of the book, God shows up. You know what the last thing Job says is? I wish I had never spoken. I cover my mouth. What's happening? This process of suffering has refined Job into being greater than he ever was. And now we read him in the Bible and he's encouraged billions of people throughout time by his story. Friends, suffering and hardship in and of itself will not destroy you. But a small sin that you let grow to be big in your life, that will unhinge you. So we pray for our sins to be forgiven and to release others from sin before we pray for strength and trials and temptations because technically your hardships will not destroy you like your sin will. But we still pray. We pray for help and strength and temptation and trials. Friends, this prayer is simple enough for kids to understand. You will never outgrow this prayer. This, this prayer, you will never outgrow it. And at different seasons of your life, if you were to slow down and really read this prayer and take it piece by piece, it will meet you in different seasons of your life. If you're working through forgiveness or temptation or needs from God or trying to put his will above your own or whatever it may be, this, friends, is the prayer that guides all prayer. So now let's go to the second heading, which is a question. Why is prayer so important if God is sovereign? Now real quick, what's that word mean? Sovereign. God's sovereignty comes from a trifecta of three of his attributes. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. And God is omnipotent. Now what's that mean for a moment? 
omnipresence of God means this. He is everywhere all the time without any diminishment of his attention or presence. So when God is everywhere, it doesn't mean that he takes a knife and chops pieces of them up and spreads it out. Omnipresence means right now in this room, the full presence of everything God is, is with us and everywhere else in the universe at the same time, always. He's omnipresent. He's also omniscient, which means he knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything. So science has proved this. Time, space, and matter are linked. Einstein has proved that time is a creation. It's not forever, right? Because as you change gravity around black holes, it affects time. If you've seen Interstellar, I'm an expert, okay? I've seen Interstellar, okay? (laughs) So we know time is a creation. And here's what that means. God is outside of time. So catch this. The story of David and Goliath and the devil being thrown in the lake of fire at the end of all things are equally present to God right now. That's why when David says in the Psalms, my sins are ever before you. David means, God, you're not stuck in time where if I did this 10 years ago, that 10 years later, God's like, oh, it's been a while since that happened. I sort of forgot. No. He sees all time, all the time. He's omniscient. That's why his love is so amazing, his steadfast love. But he's not just those two things. He's also omnipotent, which means he's unlimited in power with no limitations of any sort. This is our God. Okay, let's just run this through. If that's who God is, why in the world do we pray? He's everywhere. He has no limitations. He knows everything. God knows everything before we say anything. Now, just in case you don't know that's true, let me just show you right in the Bible. Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. Listen to what Jesus says. It's on the screen here. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. God knows everything before you say anything. So once again, why is prayer so important? We're going to go to a parable to see why. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Listen to this parable, and we'll take a couple of minutes to see how Jesus shows us the importance of prayer. You can follow on the screen. Now, he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him, saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect? Who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now let's just understand the parable. This is a desperate image. This is a widow in the ancient Near Eastern world. So she is economically vulnerable. She's socially vulnerable. She cannot provide for herself. And she is being oppressed. There's an adversary oppressing this widow. And every day she goes to the judge's house at the center of town and she knocks on the door and she's saying, you're a judge. Your job is to make straight what is crooked. Your job is to vindicate the innocent and to punish the guilty. And this is your job, God. So do your judge, do your job, judge, do your job. And the judge, Jesus says, does not 
fear God or respect people. And so one day he's sitting there and he's going, you know, I do not give a rip about God. And I certainly can't stand people. But this widow is driving me nuts. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to finally give her justice because I am so sick of her pestering me. And then so Jesus exits the parable and he says, okay, if that's how it works in this made-up story about the unjust judge, God says, how much more do you think God cares about justice and truth and that God would intervene and do what he does? And then Jesus goes on to say something amazing at the end. He asks a question. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? And the Son of Man is Jesus at his second coming. And here is exactly what Jesus is saying, in case you're not catching it. Jesus is tying a direct line between your prayer life and your perseverance in this world. Jesus is drawing a straight line between your prayer life and your perseverance. And here's what he's saying. You will not make it in this world if you don't have a prayer life. Period. Dot. You won't make it. The Son of Man will come back and he will say, there's no faith here. Because this widow who's being oppressed, give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. And when Jesus says, Listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? The point is, friends, God is not delaying. I know when you look in the news and you look at the world, your thought is something's wrong. Why is God not doing something? He has his reasons. He knows perfectly. He is holy. He is just. He is righteous. He never makes a mistake. He's not come back because he knows exactly what he's doing. Whether or not you make it and don't wander from the faith has everything to do with if you can be like this widow and have a persevering prayer life. Because Jesus is saying, without prayer, you're done. The enemy has got your number. Something will happen in your life. It will break you and you will not be mended. The Bible promises that, friends. Promises that. So, that's why prayer is so important if God is sovereign. Of course, God knows everything before we say anything. You're not praying to God because you're his counselor. God doesn't tell you to pray because God's going, man, I'm sort of in a void right now. What, what's next? Oh, that's right, that's right. I forgot what I was doing. God tells you to pray because it's good for you. It forms your heart. He listens, he engages with you relationally, but the heart of prayer is not you telling God things that he needs to know. The heart of your prayer is, Will you remain in faith or will you fade? I don't say that to hurt you or to push you away. I say that to be honest because that's what love does, right? Love is honest. Love is honest. I've not been a pastor for any more than just 10 years, but that's still long enough to know that really bad things happen in this world. This world is hard. This world can be really hard. And if you just honestly assess yourself, if you're like me, and I can be a pretty big pushover, a pretty small thing can rattle me. So what if that one thing happens that just unhinges your life? Where are we with the Lord? Will he find faith when he returns? That's why we pray, friends. And now our third question, our final heading for today's sermon. Does God answer all prayer? We're going to stay in Luke's gospel and go to chapter 11, verses 5 through 13. It'll be on the screen for you. He also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him. 
Then he will answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What father among you? If his son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead of a fish. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is another parable. Once again, you should notice something. Remember how I said the Bible teaches you to ask the right questions? If we were to ask the question, what spirit should I have when I pray? Here's two stories. A widow who's being oppressed and a dude who failed to buy bread and will not leave till he gets some because he's shamelessly bold. That's how Jesus tells you to pray. Desperate and bold. Now so often we pray but we don't actually listen to what Jesus says about what prayer is. We're like a widow and like a dude who failed to get our shopping list done. And we're coming back and we're saying, nope, not giving up. I know I look stupid right now. I know it's midnight. I know your kids are asleep. I know I'm waking all of them up. Don't care. Three loaves. Now, I need it. Three loaves. That's what Jesus says. He won't get up and give him bread because he's his friend, but he'll do it because of his shameless boldness, right? Those are the images. Isn't that amazing? It's the images Jesus gives of of how we pray. Now, he moves away from the bread guy for a moment, and he tells another parable. And he says, imagine a loving father, a loving father, and the child says, Dad, I'm hungry. Can you give me a fish? And instead of giving a fish, he gives his son a cobra, a venomous snake. Jesus says a loving father would never do that. Now, the reason why he picks fish and snakes is because they look similar. They're both long and kind of slimy. Then the second piece, what loving father, if a child asks for an egg, would give him a scorpion? And in the ancient ancient Near Eastern world, which is a a desert-type climate, scorpions can actually bend themselves up. They bend their tail around into an oval shape. So it looks like an egg. So there's something in this parable about good things and bad things that look similar to one another. So Jesus says, what what father would give his child a scorpion instead of an egg? And then so Jesus says, if you're evil and you know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more does God know how to do that? But then he adds this language that's so bold. If you seek, you will find. If you ask, you will receive. If you knock, the door will be opened. And so we go back to our question we started with, does God answer all prayer? And friends, this is not a cop-out answer. It's a biblical answer. The answer is yes and no. And I want to show you how. It is yes and no. First, You have got to notice verse 13. If we want to take Jesus at his word, we better take Jesus at his word. What does he say in verse 13? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give what? Jesus is thinking something very specific. Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. That's what Jesus is talking about. He is not saying... Everything you pray about, just tantamount, you just receive it. We'll talk about why in a moment that's not true. Jesus is so specific. If you knock, the door will be opened. If you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If what you're looking for, God, give me more of your spirit. I want to obey you more. I want to know you more. I want to walk in you more. I want more spiritual power in my life. 
I want to make a deeper impact on people. I want to be full of the Spirit. I want guidance. I want wisdom. I want your help. I want more of me to decrease and more of you to grow. Spirit, I want more of you in my life. Jesus says, you pray that way. It is yes, yes, and yes all the time. I will give you the Spirit. I will guide you. And now maybe for a quick moment, I want to be really gentle and wise here. Maybe for a moment you would say, Ryan, I've prayed about those things and felt like I didn't receive them. And I am not God and I am not sovereign. But maybe you'd be thinking, maybe I didn't ask well enough or seek hard enough or knock long enough. And with just a lot of gentleness, as a man who is limited, not as God, I do want to say, Maybe. I mean, in the Bible, when Jesus talks about prayer, the image is never, I'm a self-sufficient person who's just casually saying, hey, God, I could use some of this and use some of that. The image is desperate. The image is desperate. A desperate widow, a shamelessly bold man. We should be instructed by Jesus here, this is the posture of prayer. I don't mean that next week, If you do corporate confession, you need to drop to your knees and rip your shirt and shake your fist. Ah, I'm desperate. I'm not not saying that it's theatrical. I'm not saying that on the outside that you have to look a certain way. I'm saying our internal posture is desperation to hear from our Father. And a shameless boldness of I will not give up. Did you notice the beauty of verse 1 of that first parable? Jesus told them a parable that they would always pray and never give up. Never give up. That's our posture for prayer. So friends, in that sense, the answer to the question, does God always answer prayer, is yes. You ask for more of the Spirit. You seek hard after that. You ask for that. You continue knocking for that. God will meet you. But the answer is also no. And I want to show you why. The parable about the fish and the snake and the egg and the scorpion, here's something we all have to see. God will never give you anything that in the long run will hurt you. Never. He's a good father. He says that. If you then are evil and can give good gifts to your kids, how much more do I know how to give the right things to you? And friends, here's what this means. There have been times in your life, and I know in mine, where I have prayed deliberately for God to give me something, and I was sure that it was a fish. And he knew it wasn't. To me, it looked good. I need this job. I need this, I need out of this conflict. This has got to get healed now. This has got to change. Bring this, change this, cause this. God, do this. I know I'm, God, I'm asking for fish and eggs. I know I am. And the Father in heaven is saying, no, you don't. You don't know what you need. God will never give you something that will hurt you in the long run. And friends, Sometimes blessings given at the wrong time of life can destroy you. Opportunities that aren't the right opportunity will destroy you. Right? Even in small things, like I think about being in high school and first becoming a Christian and being a dude who didn't date a whole lot and just being sure I knew the kind of person I wanted to date or marry, right? And I ended up with Ashley, which is great. The Lord hemmed me in from making, not making a bad decision and picking somebody else. But even in that example right there, I don't know what I need. I had no idea I would be a pastor until like 10 or 12 years ago. She's a perfect helpmate for that. I had no idea. How do I know? I don't. So the point is, friends, if you pray for God to do something, even something great, He will never give you something that will hurt you. And so just just to speak more to our heart posture here, um, 
There's this amazing place in the Gospels where there's this man who's, who's lame. He can't walk. And Jesus heals him. He says, pick up your mat and walk. And then he leaves. And the Bible says Jesus met him later and said, do you know who I am? And the guy was like, you're the guy who healed me. And Jesus says this, repent of your sin and believe that nothing worse may happen to you. That's kind of ominous. Jesus just heals the guy and then catches him in an alley. He says, be careful how you live that nothing worse may happen. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I just healed your legs. I gave you a good thing. But if you use this good thing in a way that pulls you away from God, it will kill you forever. Repent and belief. It's not enough that you can walk. Repent and belief. Friends, all the good things that God gives us, there are times in your life and my life that if you got what you wanted, you can't handle it. You don't have the maturity yet. You don't have the character. I don't have the character. There's things God could give you that you can't handle, and God knows that. And he will not give you something that will hurt you. So friends, in that sense, every prayer is answered both yes and no. Ask for the Spirit. Ask for wisdom. Ask for help. Ask for more of Him in your life to change you and grow you. He'll say yes, but not everything you ask for He'll say yes to because sometimes we're asking for scorpions and snakes and don't know it. We don't know it. Let's finish on thinking about Jesus, friends. There's a lot of things the Bible does not tell us about Jesus. There are things I'd really like to know about Jesus. In a real sense, like I would like to know what was Jesus' favorite thing to eat. I would like to know some memories of Jesus' life growing up. I want to know about Jesus' half brothers, and I want to know what Jesus liked to do. Did he like to run? Was he a percussionist? Probably. He probably played the drums. <laughs> Why do I want to know that? Because Jesus is human. He knows me. He's a person. He's alive. He's real. He has a history. He has stories. He never sinned. He's a person like you and I. I'd love to know that. Bible doesn't tell us that. You know what the Bible does tell us in rich detail? How often Jesus prayed. Those gospel writers didn't tell us a lot. But they said, this Jesus we followed, he prayed so much we got to write a story about him that tells us, tells other people what he was like. Here's what he was like. He goes and prays all night sometimes. He separates from people to pray. He's really busy. He lays down the busyness to go pray. He's praying and praying and praying always. And so, friends, in light of that, I have both a correcting and an encouraging word for you. Okay? A gentle correcting word and an encouraging word. And here's the correcting word. If the Son of God God in the flesh, who had all power, thought it was necessary to have a regular rhythm to his prayer life. What is your and my excuse? What's your excuse for not fighting to have rhythms to a prayer life? That you get up and you pray. Right At our house, we pray around meals and we pray before bed. And I know that sounds super plain Jane, evangelical Christianity, now I lay me down to sleep, you know, that kind of a thing. But friends, like, you got to get that out of you. You eat food, what, three times a day, unless you have some meal plan you're on? You drink water throughout the day, you sleep on a rhythm, that's what prayer is. It's a rhythm, it's a way of life, it's a rhythm. You got to walk in that. Here's the encouraging word. This is what you were made for. Friends, when you pray, do you realize you are tasting, you are tasting a bit of eternity. God made you, and God says, I know every inch of your life. And God says, I am eager for the day in my plan where you come home to be with me. And we get to have fellowship forever. I will know all of you. You will know all of me. I will make you feel all the love and joy and hope that you wanted your spouse to do, 
but they just couldn't quite do it perfectly because they're just a person. And that you wanted your kids to do, but they can't do it. And that you wanted your parents and your career and the world, the things that you longed to feel that you grasped at and thought it would be there, when I take you home, I will overwhelm you. You will stand under the waterfall of my love and you will never leave. And when you pray, you are tasting a foretaste of that. You were made to be in fellowship with God. And prayer is that fellowship. So, friends, this week, for our discipline together, if you get your phone and get the church app, if you don't already have it, you can use some of these cards and the QR code to get that. You'll find the Lent guide. Here's our goal. Our goal is to pray the Lord's Prayer twice a day. Pray the Lord's Prayer twice a day from tomorrow through Saturday. And you know what you can do? You can pray the words just as they are, or maybe you want to kind of do it in your own words. Just getting to the heart of it, right? The, the way we talked about the structure of that prayer, God, you be glorified. God, your will before mine. God, my daily needs. God, my sins and the sins of others. And God, the temptations and deliverance from evil around me. However you want to pray that out, we're going to do that this week. And friends, I mean, there's a lot of teaching about prayer. And I don't, it blows my mind a little bit to think if all of us started praying like widows and guys that didn't buy their bread, what the Lord would do. If there was that level of, and by what the Lord would do, I mean the work in our hearts and the work in hearts of people around us if we approached prayer that way with a desperation to hear from him. Don't be afraid to ask him of anything, anything. From the most radical healing you can imagine to winning a t-ball game. Be in communion with your father. I don't know if you're playing t-ball, but maybe your kids teaching them to pray for that. <laughs> Friends, pray with me. Father God, we so praise you for this gift of prayer. Lord, because it could have been so that when you came to teach us what it means to be fully human, Jesus, you could have chosen to teach nothing about prayer. God, you, you could be the kind of God who says, Here's all the rules I want you to keep, but I don't really want to know you. God, you could have said, I only listen to certain type of people. God, you could have said, at the end of the day, I just don't want to bother with you like that unjust judge. But Lord, you are not that way. God, you delight in relationship with us. You love us immensely. And Lord, we all together as a church confess our prayerlessness. God, we confess our quickness to pretend like there is no spiritual world around us. To just treat everything like it is what it is. And to make relentless excuses as long as our right arm. To try and tell ourselves why it's okay that we don't make a change here. Father God, would you gently and firmly, as a good father, break in this morning as we worship and sing and take communion on the back end of service right here in Wichita, Kansas, right now? And God, would you soften our hearts to hunger for a rich prayer life? God, help us hunger for that, to want to walk in this Christian discipline, to know you, to stay in fellowship with you, to persevere in this hard world. God, to shamelessly and boldly ask you for things. God, maybe there's someone here right now who is thinking, Ryan, you don't know me. You don't really know me. I sin. I'm a mess up. I come here to church and do things, but I'm not that committed and I'm maybe kind of fakey fake and this isn't for me. God, would you break in and say, be quiet. You quit listening to yourself and you listen to me. 
God, speak that, that we would shamelessly, boldly approach you in prayer. Like a guy who failed to buy bread, says, I don't care if it wakes up your kids, I'm here for the show. God, give us hearts that aren't pushovers. God, we love you and we thank you for how good you are and that you never say anything or give us anything to ultimately hurt us because you love us. Let that be communicated right now in every moment that we spend here together as a church for the rest of this time. In Jesus' name, amen.